I'm here to talk about Lacuna Space, obviously, and I think that this is going to be a watershed year for the whole of satellite IoT. I think it's going to be the year when we're going to find out that all of the companies that have been trying to do a very similar thing to Lacuna Space, we're going to get to find out which of those are really bluffing, which of those are really capable of doing it, and which ones are going to really deliver. And we are really, really looking forward to that. But probably even more than that, this is going to be the year when we're going to find out what all of you folks are going to get to do with what we've been working so hard to achieve, which is to provide the connectivity to give you all the chance to use it in completely different ways than we imagined when we first set out on this journey. So I think the theme for the talk is very much this is not just going to be the year of the rat, it's going to be the year of the sat. So, the first of several bad puns, I'll warn you. So, a quick recap for those that um, may not be familiar with what we do. What we're about is providing connectivity over satellite that isn't as competition to terrestrial networks, it's a complement to terrestrial networks. It enables terrestrial networks to reach into the places that hitherto have been unconnected. And what's different about us from the other satellite companies is that we're very much LoRa-based, and we do it with LoRa directly from the devices to the satellite. So there is no modem, there is no terminal. The device itself, the sensor, can be the terminal, the modem that communicates directly with the satellite. And we are the only people that are doing that and doing that in a way that is completely scalable. That, of course, has only yet, ever been possible because of the collaboration that we've got with Semtech, and I just have to thank those folks for all the support they've given us. It would not have been possible to get to this point on this stage without their help. Now, when I describe it like that, most people sort of nod and say, yeah, that sounds good. We've heard the message. We heard you talk about open designs, open systems, open standards. All of that sounds brilliant, and they're sort of nodding away. But the bit that really captures people's attention is when I turn around and say, and this is it. It can be really this simple. This is what a device looks like. It's something you can build yourself. That can be battery powered. That lasts years. This particular one's got temperature, pressure, humidity, you know, the usual sort of suite of sensors on just as a demo. But that itself, for a few tens of euros you can build, it will connect directly with the satellite for years. It includes the antenna. That's the antenna you can see on the top. And it is that simple. And of course, I'll come on to tell you in a few moments exactly um, how you can sort of go about getting your hands on this and how you can get connected and when and all of those sorts of things. So firstly, quick recap on kind of how it works uh, with the satellites. The satellites are in a low Earth orbit. Uh, they're about 500 kilometers up, so relatively close compared to many satellites in orbit. And they go around the Earth very, very quickly, 100 minutes to do a complete orbit over the poles. The Earth rotates underneath, and that means they scan out the whole of the globe. It's a pretty big footprint. You see quite a big area. It passes over a sensor, collects the data, continues onto a ground station, which is the size of a small country in this video, and then transmits all of the information back to our server that looks to be about the size of London in this diagram. From there, it goes back out to the users. All of which securely encrypted, all of which is LoRaWAN compatible. So that's the sort of quick background to how it works. One of the things that kind of caught us a little bit by surprise just before Christmas was sending out one of our devices uh, to the guy with the Swiss accent, who I'm sure will be known to many of you. Um, kind of does absolutely wonderful videos, and we kind of sent him one just as a friend. We weren't really expecting him to kind of actually do a video on it, and all of a sudden, up popped the video where he had a go at taking one of these devices, getting connected to our first satellite, and he managed it. And suddenly, uh, we had Thousands of inquiries, not that we were short of inquiries beforehand, but I'd just like to say a big thank you to Andreas for melting down our website. Uh, that was a really nice Christmas present. Thank you very much. Um, 
The satellites themselves, obviously a key bit of this is trying to understand when you can see the satellites and when you can't. Um, using satellites to access remote regions of the world is a great plus, but of course with every plus there is a downside. The downside with the satellites is they're not there all of the time, so you need to understand what the type of service level you're going to get and over what duration, and we'll come on to explaining that. But we've been running a couple of workshops here to help people understand how all of that works. I think they've been jam-packed, but there's another one today if you, if you want to go along and try and sort of see if there are any seats vacant. Uh, failing that, of course, the videos will all be online. Uh, the intention is, of course, that um, by July of this year, we're going to go into our sort of first open service. In that stage, we're going to have five operational satellites. What we've been doing in the meantime is kind of successfully commissioning the whole system around the world. And this is kind of a really important part of it for us. Um, we get the challenge of trying to make sure it's going to work in different regions, with different regulations, with different frequencies, with different factors like duty cycles, whatever. And the way we've addressed that and the way we've done it is we've been sending out test boxes. And you may have seen some of these on uh, social media, uh, various people who've been sort of um, helping us by positioning them. Well, what we basically do is we put the devices into uh, an IP67 enclosure, we put it out into the open, and we try and choose an area where there is um, LoRa connectivity, usually things network connectivity. So then what we can do is we can command the device in a test program to say, hey, send to the satellite now. And then we can do this around the world as the satellite's orbiting, and we can try different parameters, and we can refine it, and, we can try, and what we're doing is basically building in the algorithms that turn around and say, These, this is the best way of using it in this particular region, and we're building up that knowledge on a global basis. So we've got successful test boxes, some of the pictures here, um, the places are too, num too many to mention, but uh, I think far left is in Japan. The other one was uh, in a field in the south of France. There's some in Amsterdam. There's South Africa. There's America. There's uh, lots of these around. But what you get to see in the center of this is exactly what happens when a satellite comes across on a pass. Each of those dots is a successful transmission of a message that we've detected. So we wait until the satellite is sort of 30 degrees up in the air. And then we start sending messages to it, and you can see the frequency with which messages are received as the satellite passes over. So that's the stuff that's keeping us really, really busy at the moment. Um, but some people out there have kind of pestered us sufficiently and that we've kind of given them sort of boxes and devices. And this is a really exciting bit because we're getting to see real applications that I guess we'd never envisaged. And that, that to us is tremendously fulfilling. And one example is um, this one, uh, first LoRa satellite wildfire detectors. Of course, wildfires, very hot topic. Um, I warned you about the puns. Um, and this one, we got to thank Scott Waller, who has uh, done this absolutely brilliant thing. Uh, he, he's got essentially this uh, suite of environmental sensors that senses the plumes downstream of fires. And he's built this device that essentially is completely fire resistant. The beauty of it is it can measure a whole load of environmental parameters from the plume of a fire, which gives guidance to firefighters as to how fire is spreading. And it, it's all fire resistant and he's communicating the data back to the satellite, uses next to no power because, of course, it has to rely upon battery power. Um, he's an ex-firefighter, and he's doing wonderful things with this. We can't wait to see that sort of turning into a full product, but he's out there demonstrating it, and it's working really, really well. One of the other exciting demos that we've done in the last couple of weeks is this, this one. It was in collaboration with the European Space Agency and a Dutch company called Plant E. Uh, I think this is something that's really quite remarkable. Um, I, I know that many people say, hey, you get to do things with these systems and devices that we never envisaged when we started. And you know, everybody says it, but there is no way on earth that this was even close in our thoughts when we first started. This is a company that have come up with a smart technology to generate energy from plants. So it's a bacteria that naturally exists in the soil underneath the plant 
Um, you can essentially put electrodes into the soil and the plant itself will generate a small amount of electricity. So the interesting bit for us was we were thinking about a demo to kind of prove how low energy was being consumed in transporting these messages to the satellite. So what you have here is a plant that generates the electricity to send a message to the satellite. So the sensors on board measure the soil humidity, uh, sorry, soil moisture, humidity in the air, temperature, all of those sorts of parameters about its health and status, and it transmits that to a satellite using power it's generated itself. I mean, not something we could have ever have envisaged when we started out. Tremendous technology. If you want to pop along to our stand, uh, some of the folks in plant here are there and can talk about it. But sort of, I think that this has got, uh, who knows where this is going to go in terms, of, in terms of applications. But plants reporting on their own health and status and using their own energy to generate it. Absolutely incredible. Getting um, back down to Earth a bit more. I missed out a pun there. I missed the one the journalists called it the internet of the turf. I thought that was absolutely brilliant uh, stuff on some of the headlines. Anyway, uh, back down to earth, secure elements. Great big topic at last year's conference. Uh, big announcements about the, secure, the use of secure elements and how that was being enabled because security, of course, big concern to everybody, completely rightfully so. Um, we have on our devices incorporated the secure elements and during the course of the last uh, two weeks have demonstrated those working with our sensors. So our sensors that communicate to the satellite have a secure element on them. We've got all the mechanisms in place where that works with the join server, exchanges information to derive a shared key so that all of that encryption is there perfectly. The important point about this is this is what gives us the opportunity to scale this is, the, this is the insight that's given in, in, by employing these secure elements. You take out all of the hassle of provisioning keys on devices, you can do it at scale, and the scale is what we're all about. If we're going to achieve the levels of pricing that we want to, we have to enable lots of people to get connected cheaply and simply. So tapping into that LoRa ecosystem where the secure element stuff has already been done, and because we're communicating direct with the satellite over LoRaWAN, we can use exactly that same system in order to do this. And we've done it, and it's working. We believe that was the first demonstration of the use of secure elements over satellite IoT. If anyone knows differently, please let me know. Okay, the question that we get asked very often is this one, is, all sounds wonderful, when are we going to get it? When are we going to be able to start to use it? And I think we're now at a position where all of the commissioning is going well enough for us to start to disclose some of those timelines. We're feeling, we're feeling very confident now. So summer of this year is when we're going to go into the first sort of pre-operational trials. We're hoping then to be able to offer everybody the opportunity to connect a standard device for free. And uh, I'll be coming on to tell you what you need to do to do that. And it's basically an opportunity for people to experiment with the system, understand how it works, and explore the possibilities. And the aim is that by the last quarter of this year, we're going to be going full service and completely open. And I'll tell you a bit more now about what that means. Now, the first bit is for summer of this year and how you kind of get connected. You're clearly going to need a dev kit of some sort. You're going to need to understand how to do it. So I'm pleased to announce today that we've, uh, the first partner producing a dev kit uh, is a company called RF Things. And we've got on the stand, you've probably seen some of the antennas around. Uh, these folks are going to be there and ready about July of this year to sell their dev kits. It's a really smart dev kit because it's a modular one on a single PCB. So you can put different sensor suites on it, different uh, radio modules, different power modules, depending upon your particular application. You'll be able to buy all of this via their web shop. There is already stuff up on their web shop so you can see the sort of product leaflets and what it's all about. That is the first of a few dev kit suppliers that we hope to be announcing 
with those suppliers having different focuses on different things. This one very much is kind of driven at the sort of maker market or people who want to kind of explore the possibilities before getting into a bigger program. So to be a bit more precise about what you need, what you really need is the only bit that's physically different about it is a circular polarized antenna. And that's available, it's working really well. You'll be able to buy it from that shop. Um, I should have said that the genius really behind the whole RF Things company uh, is Fabian Ferrero, who you've probably heard in other talks at this conference and is around doing workshops as well. Um, they, they basically are the company that are industrializing the stuff that he's been working on. So you need the antenna. That's the only thing that's physically different. That antenna communicates circular polarization up to the satellite, but also does the traditional sort of linear polarization to connect to terrestrial devices. You need the dev board. And the other thing you'll need is the open, the stack, uh, um, uh, the LoRaWAN stack that's going to be available from us open source in July. So what about if you don't want to build your own device, if you're somebody that just wants to buy devices from elsewhere and connect to a system? We're starting to work with partners who are building this connectivity into their devices. Um, I'll pick out a few because these are, these are some really good use cases, I think. So yesterday, you may have heard Luca talking about some of the work that INAS is doing on wildlife tracking. They've built the satellite connectivity into uh, collars that go onto elephants for elephant tracking. So it's out there. I mean, that is real field testing. It's out there, it's working, uh, and we're kind of really excited about the possibilities there. Um, working with uh, smart parks and also working on a couple of other projects around the world. If you, if you want to know more about that, Luca's the man to talk to, doing some great stuff, wildlife tracking. Um, Miramiko also got a stand here. They're building the connectivity into several of their products. They also demonstrated getting connected to the satellite in no time flat. We sent them, a, sent them an antenna. They kind of hooked it up, set up the software, and kind of surprised us as to how quickly it was up and working. So those guys are going to have a suite of products as well. And finally, yeah, parametric engineering, uh, Swiss base, specialized in really hardened uh, um, electronics. But those guys have got a really popular solar-powered radar object detector. They're going to build the connectivity into that to do things like vehicle counting, vehicle tracking, loads of different applications. If there's anybody else out there that's interested in building our connectivity directly into your products, we'd be very pleased to talk to you. Please come to the stand. Uh, we, we'd, we'd love to hear more from suppliers who are interested in that. Um, I mentioned about the fact that we also work seamlessly with terrestrial applications. Of course, that's one of the important themes of what we do, interoperability, really simple interoperability. Quick demonstration of what we mean by that. This is a sailing boat that's got one of those small devices on. Uh, when it comes into a port, it kind of hooks up to terrestrial LoRa network. Uh, we've been kind of surprised about all the places it's been going and finding uh, uh, the community network and hooking up to that easily. We can then find out what's happening, update it with new sort of test cases to trial. When it goes out to sea, uh, as it currently was a couple of days ago, you can kind of see that all the data that's just coming back off the device, all battery powered. When it's out at sea, obviously communicating with the satellite. So that's all part of the theme of what we're trying to do. Make it simple, make it easy, make sure it's gonna work first time when you all get your hands on this stuff. Um, the next part is really how we do the integration with other private networks. Because I mentioned at the start, what we're really about is extending coverage, not competing with those private networks. And during the past few weeks, we've been showcasing the work that we've done to do the interfaces through to other private networks. So we, with the things industry, we, uh, we have an instance of the... Uh, their LoRa server, and we've shown the connectivity between that private network on a things industry um, uh, instance, and we've shown connectivity back to the satellite, and we've demonstrated that end-to-end. -end. So actually now, it's really, really simple. If you're one of the 
uh, commercial industrial users who's got a things industry instance uh, of, of a network server. It's as easy as ticking a box and you actually then are integrated into our network. So if you've got sensors that are out of reach of your own network, but happen to be picked up by our satellites, you then can flow those back through into your system. It's all there, it's all working. Um, you can kind of come and see it in action at the stand. There's a bit of a demo that shows a device there, uh, communicates to a satellite. Um, in case you hadn't noticed, uh, we've got a satellite hanging up in the ceiling here, so we're doing it direct to that. It goes down to our back end, and the magic in the middle that makes all this work is the packet broker. So the packet broker that's been discussed by Johan, done several presentations onto it, that's the mechanism by which we will distribute data back into any other private instance. Or in fact, any other packet broker we can configure as well. But that's the one that we've got working. It's up and running at the moment. It will turn around and say, hey, satellite, I've received a message. Based on this Laura Net ID, I can see the owner of the message is this. That person is running this network over there. They then have the option that they want to take it, that they want to see it, that they want to see the message, they want to see the metadata, or whatever. And in the demo we've got set up on the stand, it's going through to a things industry instance, and then we've written an application so that it just pops up on our phones on Slack so that we can kind of show the message going through the whole chain. So that's sort of like a demonstration of the end-to-end -end chain, and uh, you're welcome to come across and see it in action. Stan's been pretty busy, which we're very, very pleased about, obviously. Um, the other part that's really important is this whole issue about connectivity and where you're going. I've mentioned that by July of this year, five of the satellites will be operational. Um, the eventual aim is to have 240 satellites. We're currently working on the next batch of 24. Uh, the goal is to get all of those 240 up by uh, 2025. And that will give us revisit times of about five minutes. So you're going to be able to see a satellite every single five minutes. So that, I think, is about all I hope to say. We'd love to hear from more people, sort of network operators, who, who kind of want to integrate this into their systems. We'd love to hear from more people who want to, um, who want to build connectivity into standard commercial off-the-shelf devices. And if you're interested in getting involved in some of the operational trials with us in July, please drop by the stand, make sure your name is on the mail list, or come by the website, drop us a note. If you sent us messages into the website, we will get to you. There is a huge backlog, and I'm sorry if we haven't responded instantly. Blame Andreas. Um, but also, if you want to hear what's coming up uh, on Twitter, we try and sort of post stuff up as and when it's coming up. We'll do more as time comes, but we're not one of those companies that puts out tons and tons of PR just for PR's sake. So thank you for your time and attention. Well, thank you very much, Rob Spirit. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for taking Laura to infinity and beyond. And I can assume there are some questions about that. Uh, anyone? Yes, here at the front. You make my job quite easy. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, a technical question. Um, what is the capacity of the LoRa E compared to the standard LoRa One? Um, so it's it's not a simple question to answer, but it's significantly higher in terms of obviously compared to standard LoRa One. So uh, as exactly as you've inferred, because we've got a large footprint on the satellite, we see many many devices at one time. So we've had to use LoRa E, and we've had to put many more parallel processing demodulation chains on the satellite in order to make sure that we can process all of those without collisions. Um, it's literally thousands of messages that we can uh, decode instantaneously in the field of view. So the limitation we believe at the moment is not the capacity on the satellite. Uh, we'll be able to handle everything we see. Um, yeah. Rob, we have another question here from the audience. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask about latency. So I know um, using satellite backhaul is about four, five, six seconds. How does that compare to low Earth and 
are you storing forwarding? Yeah, a, a great question. It's like everything in life. You, you don't get everything for free. The downside is the latency. Like you say, there is the sort of, it's not the couple of hundred milliseconds for the, for the distance that you traveled. It's also the time it takes for the satellite to come around to the ground station and pull the data down. So it depends how many, satellite, how many satellites you've got up there and how many ground stations you've got. Um, come July, we're guaranteeing that you'll kind of, you'll, you'll be able to get a, a couple of messages a day at least. Lots of latitudes, you'll be able to get a lot more. And normally you'll be able to get those back within six hours. Obviously, as we get more satellites up there, it's going to be a lot more frequently than that. Um, probably uh, a really good example is that, you know, it takes 100 minutes to go around the, around the globe so you can get to a ground station in 100 minutes. But you kind of... You can add extra ground stations, you can halve that, you can chop it down. So it kind of depends exactly on the timeline. But yeah, we'll get down to five minutes latency in the system when we've got the full constellation up there. Uh, Rob, I also like your animations quite a lot. Uh, are they also online? Uh, they will be if you want. Yep, no yep, problem. Please put them online and okay. we'll forward them through Twitter using the hashtag The Things Conference. Uh, Absolutely. Okay, thank you very will much, do. Rob Spirit. Thank you.